Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us on this International Day of Peace. We need to cherish and take a moment to appreciate uh, days like this and really just inspire ourselves and others so that we can make sure that this positive energy is felt. My name is Penny Maria Jackson, PM for short, and I am a board member with this amazing theater company. You see uh, Kiang is already on and we have so many other members of our community, including you who are here with us today. Um, we also have some special guests and as we're going through the program, everyone will be introduced. As we start, let's take a moment to get to know one another. Please feel free to go ahead and drop in the chat if you would like or feel comfortable. Um, your names, your pronouns, um, whose land you're on, um, anything that you feel like sharing with us just so that we can just know a little bit about one another. Um, as we prepare to open the space for our Whiteness on Fire program, I'd like to go ahead and share some of our community benefit, our community agreements um, with everyone that is meant to benefit each and every individual here in this space. So um, we build a culture of consent to be our full selves, right? So you don't have to hide anything in this space. You can be your full selves. We work, we work with fluidity. We move up when we have the energy and step back when we don't. So if you feel really passionate about something, please take a seat at the long table and speak. And if you don't have anything to say, don't feel the pressure, don't feel pressured uh, to do so. Um, we recognize one person cannot be everything and no one is the single authority on anything, right? It takes many, many people, right, to form one completion. So everyone knows something and brings something different to the table. We vocalize what we need. We are open with the group. So again, there will be a chance for everyone to share and participate. The next one, uh, we are okay with not knowing and value everyone's insight. Uh, the next one, we approach what we do with mental health care and care work in mind, and we take care of each other, not advantage of each other. So again, we're here to support one another and lift everyone up and understand that, you know, maybe some folks may have a different response to a topic and we need to give that person space, let them sit in that moment. Um, the next one, we explore messiness and believe many hands make light work. So, you know, we're figuring this out. We're not here sticking to Eurocentric ideal, ideals per se. We're bringing together our different cultures, our different understanding. And, you know, we're, we're working through it together. We're discovering um, as a community. Um, we move at the speed of trust. So we understand that everyone doesn't know everyone here. So, you know, uh, we may be a little bit more reserved, but again, feel free to share as you can. We build proactive ways to address toxic, abusive dynamics and call out tendencies for urgency and efficiency. Um, so again, we're really being mindful about everything that we're doing. We don't wanna create a harmful atmosphere. This is about learning and moving forward. We collaborate to co-create experiences, experiments, and express ourselves as a calculated risk. So again, as we're rebuilding or building the future that we want, we're, we're doing that in a very mindful way. We're trying to see what piece fits where. We remove the binary of yes, no decision-making by embracing consensus-based decision-making. Um, so it's not just yes or no, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. We mix together to get the perfect flavor. We tune into life affirming flow with our collaborators. Who are you? You who are here with us tonight, you are our team members and we honor our commitment. So that means that we are going to be moving forward tonight with all of these things that we just discussed um, in the back of our minds. These are our agreements and this is how we will operate tonight. So again, 
thank you so much for joining us and I'll turn it over to my next team member. Thank you. Thanks, PM. So um, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. Um, what I'm gonna do is to uh, share with you a little bit more about our organization and tonight's program, just so that you know what's gonna happen tonight. So for those of you who don't know, Kyung's Pacific Bean is a peacemaking theater company. Our mission is to promote a culture of peace and nonviolence by working with artists, non-artists and local communities to transform personal and communal experiences of oppression into peace messages made public through performance. Um, so my work is influenced by experimental theater artists like Young Jin Lee and Lee Brewer, who are my personal mentors. But we have an origin in anti-oppression work based on my training with Auguste Boal's Theater of the Oppressed. Um, how many of you have had experiences with Boal's Theater Forum? Um, can I see maybe some hands? Okay, all right, so some. Uh, okay, that's good. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Augusto Boal is a Brazilian theater maker and uh, <clears throat> his theater forum uh, is a theatrical framework that uh, allows artists and non-artists to tell stories of oppression. And then it invites spect actor, uh, spectators to become spect actors for social change through the theater. So we're gonna do something similar by sharing with your work and while at the same time inviting our community partners to uh, share the work they are doing and eventually invite you to join us in a conversation to address the systems of oppression that are perpetuating state violence in our communities today. So tonight is a participatory event and we hope that you're ready to join us in a conversation. Uh, and uh, just wanted to let you know that we really welcome your participation in tonight's program. So we'll begin uh, the first hour by sharing with you a couple of music videos to introduce you to the world of Nero's Roman Empire. And then we're gonna take turns and allow, uh, invite some of our community partners to introduce themselves and the work they're doing in community. And by the end of the first hour, we're hoping that all of the artwork and the work that's happening um, out with our community partners inspires you um, to join us in a conversation during the second hour where we'll have a long table with our guest speakers. Um, the long table is gonna be facilitated by Jason Wu, who's co-chair of Gapimni, and Sarah Nazir, who's coordinator of the People's Plan NYC, Eric Lockley from the Movement Theater Company, and Rohan uh, Jolie from uh, the Blasian March uh, will be our featured speakers that will kick off our long table. Um, unfortunately, Ju Hyung Kang from uh, Communities United for Police Reform um, uh, couldn't join us. Uh, so, so, um, and, and is feeling ill. So we hope Ju Hyun uh, feels better um, and gets well soon. So um, the long table uh, will be about a 50 minute long conversation during our second hour. And uh, hour, um, we're gonna go back to Nero and invite you to be the first audience to see the end of this um, five hour Zoom epic we've been making since the beginning of the pandemic last September. <laughs> And uh, this event is really special to us because it is the culmination of the developmental phase of our project and also the culmination of a series of conversations we started since last fall. So um, just a little bit more about Nero and we'll get straight into the work. Uh, what is Nero? Nero is our new work in progress. And I wanna emphasize it is a work in progress. It's the story of George W. Bush's war on terror retold as a story of the rise and fall of Nero's Roman Empire. In our play, Nero is a 14-year-old tyrant set on the throne by his mother, Agrippina, who has killed his previous emperor, Emperor Claudius, and married Nero to Claudius's 12-year-old daughter. Um, and uh, this, um, Claudius's daughter, Octavia, um, also has a brother uh, named Britannicus who was the rightful heir of the, the throne, but Nero has taken that power. So um, for some of you, uh, you may know Nero as the despot who played the liar during the great fire of Rome, uh, which in our play is our version of the terrorist attacks on, of 9-11. And Nero's war in Perthia is our war in terror. Um, so now what we're gonna show you is a music video for a song that takes place in the middle of act two, when Nero's lover Acte has committed suicide after Nero has fallen in love with his new mistress, Sura, 
a Perthian woman gifted to him as a sex slave by his friend Otho. The song is about Nero's awakening as a young man at the age of 14, discovering love by falling in love with one of his political enemies. Um, just as a technical note, um, to improve your experience um, uh, of our digital production, what we'll be doing is dropping Vimeo links and passwords for you to see the videos from your computers rather than us sharing them through our Zoom platform. So um, the link is gonna go in the chat. Uh, please don't leave this Zoom session. We're going to ask you to watch the video and come back. Uh, this is the first music video for the night, I Feel Nothing. And the password is Nero2021. Uh, hope you enjoy and we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Why is it? Why is it that I feel nothing? Octaves blown to pieces And I feel nothing Is it cause you raped me, mama? Is it cause you left me, mama? Is it cause you married Claudius? Is it cause you killed him, mama? Why is it? Why is it that I feel nothing? Here's my wife, Octavia, and I feel nothing. Is it cause I stole her power? Is it cause I do not love her? Is it cause she won't divorce me? Is it cause she plots against me? To gather the shattered, to mend what's been battered, to glue back the pieces, to please all my misses. Thank you. I, I'm guessing our folks are, are coming back. Welcome back. <laughs>
Thank you. Uh, yes, please feel free to share your comments um, in the chat. Uh, a lot of the artists that were involved in this project are here with us, so I'm sure that they'll love to hear your responses. We've been working in isolation for a year, so uh, these claps are very well deserved and hard earned. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm going to just keep us moving along um, as thank you. Um, so as, as I uh, shared with you, um, this is a kind of Shakespearean epic and we've been making it from Zoom with everyone working from home since last September. And as we've been doing this work, what we've been doing is inviting community partners to come experience the work with us as we all navigated how to make theater during a pandemic, but also explore the very broad theme, theme of addressing white supremacy in our communities. In a series of conversations we've been having almost every other two, three months um, since last September. So uh, for those of you who um, may need some help, we wanted to share with you our definition of uh, white supremacy, uh, which we're uh, borrowing from Bertita Martinez, who defines white supremacy as a historically based, institutionally perpetuated system of exploitation and oppression of continents, nations, and peoples of color by white peoples and nations. And according to Andrea Smith, uh, white supremacy is sustained by three pillars, uh, one being the uh, history of genocide and colonialism of America, the second slavery and capitalism, and the third orientalism and war, which is of particular significance to me as a third generation North Korean who was named part of the axis of evil during this war on terror, uh, sort of normalizing this perpetual war that we've been witnessing in the Middle East. Um, Harsha Walia added to this framework a fourth pillar, which is border imperialism. And this elaborates on how now we're witnessing the militarization of our borders, concentration camps, and the anti-immigrant policing, which is perpetuating white supremacy even further. Um, so we opened up this conversation on white supremacy and given last year uprising in defense of black lives and in response to the rising violence against Asian Americans in our communities, our conversations really centered black Asian solidarity work against violence taking place in our communities right now. And our anti sort of imperial inquiries as artists uh, focused on adopting abolitionist frameworks to address state violence. Um, so just as a provocation, um, I just wanted to share with you uh, a number uh, which makes me ponder how much we really do value peace in America, uh, going through the George W. Uh, Bush's presidential archives in Dallas, I found out documents outlining that the US federal budget for peace in the year 2000 was $20,000. Uh, meanwhile, Brown University estimates that post 9-11 wars have cost $8 trillion. And the 2022 fiscal year budget for the NYPD is 98.5 billion, which is the largest budget for police forces in America. And um, the uh, US defense budget is $778 billion, which is as much as the next 11 countries that the world spends combined. So just think about those numbers and how all of these systems are designed to oppress people of color. And then you begin to sense sort of the mood in which we've been making our work. Um, so the next music video we're going to share with you is actually about grief and mourning. Um, this takes place in act three of Nero when Sura has become empress of Rome, disguised as a visiting actress performing in the plays of Nero's tutor, uh, the playwright Seneca. So here, Sura and Nero play Ismene and Antigone two sisters mourning the death of their brother Haman, asking why are we born if we are meant to go? So we're gonna drop the link to the next music video and we'll see you in another few. This pain, why do we leave in somber silence and not tell others where we go? Why do we depart in such to know you'll never 
Alrighty, so um, <laughs> I love to see everyone smiles. This is great. <laughs> um, yes, uh, so uh, that's a sort of a taste of the work that we've been doing so far. We'll share some more, uh, but now we wanna uh, make some space and introduce you to Rohan, who's gonna be speaking a bit more about the work they've been doing with the Blasian March. So take it away, Rohan. Hi everybody, my name is Rohan, uh, pronouns they, Sha, and Tha. I'm coming to you from the occupied territory of the Lenape people, also known as New York City. Um, uh, first off, happy Sokot, happy um, Mid-Autumn Festival, folks who celebrate. Um, and as of, for folks who need a visual description, um, I've got like medium 
brown skin, I got a black tank top on, curly black hair. Um, <clears throat> and behind me is a backdrop of several protesters at an action here in New York um, in the winter, um, varying racial gender identities. There's a red banner behind me that has chrysan chrysanthemums and says, unite against hate. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I guess to speak a little bit more on my work, um, the Blasian March is a solidarity initiative between Black, Asian, and Blasian communities. And we achieve this through education on our parallel experiences with uh, white settler violence, as well as mutual celebration of each other. And, uh, and all of our in-person actions, this usually comes through by means of performance art um, and actually build solidarity. So um, if I could switch to the PowerPoint, that'd be wonderful. If not, I can manage it from here. Um, stand by, technical difficulties. Just a second. Okay, <laughs> I'll do a happy dance in my corner. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> also really happy to see so many familiar folks on this call that I recognize. So, hi people. <laughs> Oh, amazing. Thank you. So um, this is just a quick overview of kind of like the guiding principles of how um, we build solidarity in the movement, at least in my part of the movement work. Um, I'm going to also emphasize over and over again that I am not an expert on solidarity. Uh, and I pretend to be an expert on solidarity. This is simply where I am in the journey of my work um, as a performing artist, as an activist. So I guess we can go to the next slide. Um, so what is solidarity? Um, according to the Merriam-Webster's dictionary, it's called unity or agreement of feeling or action, especially among individuals with a common interest, mutual support within a group. Um, I'm going to say that this definition, of course, is very limited because it doesn't really account for the fact that the, we, are, we are looking at the idea of solidarity through a colonial white language, which is English. Um, this definition by default, therefore, is a white narrative, a white perspective on solidarity. Um, it doesn't account to the nuances of what it means to build community in response to collective oppression or collective trauma, inherited trauma, or things like that. Um, also needs to take into account that language evolves over time. Language um, evolves by region, language also evolves by the community. Um, so yeah, um, this is just a quick photo of our pride rally that we did this year um, celebrating black and Asian LGBT communities. Um, yeah, so you'll see there's a trans uh, woman with blue hair, uh, a light blue dress. Um, there are other femmes of color there's a mixed Filipina and Native American woman uh, who's one of our speakers. And um, one thing I really love about using performance art in these spaces is also to rearrange um, what my really dear friend on the West Coast, Soleil Yu, calls political imagination, um, how we literally imagine our political experiences or politicized experiences. So in this photo, you'll also see um, to the left of me, um, there is a person playing a Filipino percussion instrument. And so that's how we use, for example, art as part of the movement, part of the action that we do. Um, next slide, please. So based on what I've experienced, what I've observed within our communities, um, this is kind of my um, sort of interpretation on taking on building solidarity within our communities. Um, it goes as I have so far experienced it into three categories that are um, overlapping, intersectional, fluid. Um, so one um, is internal healing, another is interpersonal healing, and the third would be intercultural or really um, intercommunal power exchange. Uh, next slide, please. So internal healing, um, what exactly is that? So for me, I define that as looking at how we actually re 
present or perceive ourselves within this colonial state? How do we actually understand how those three pillars or four pillars have actually really influenced um, our perspective on one another? And that means self-education and re-education on our experiences. Um, being able to understand where we've committed harm to each other as communities of color. Um, next slide, please. So interpersonal healing, um, I think comes through when we look at how we look at how those roots of white colonial miseducation has turned into things like anti-Blackness or anti-Asianness and how we as individuals has harmed one another. And those dialogues can turn into accountability processes. And I definitely want to stress over and over again that accountability is not carceral. Accountability is healing for everyone involved. Um, next slide, please. And finally, um, intercultural or intercommunal power exchange. So that can look like in many different ways. That can look like, for example, in theater or in performing arts, hiring Black people, hiring Asian people in casting or as directors um, behind and behind the scenes off the camera, making sure that our communities are in positions of leadership. Um, this can also manifest as resource sharing, knowledge sharing, um, politically move, move, moving together by means of voting. Um, we saw that recently in the last general election um, in Georgia, where you saw how Black women organized to flip um, state of Georgia, but also Asian American women organizers increased the Asian American vote in Georgia by over 90%. Simultaneously in Arizona, you had indigenous women also organizing to flip that state blue. Um, also the Blasian March itself, um, simply sharing space uh, together to actually hold space together. Um, yeah, next slide. And so I'll just leave it here with a quick quote by Grace Lee Boggs. Um, her work, especially since she worked with Martin Luther King um, and her Black husband, James, uh, has been really inspiring to my work as well. So I'm just gonna end with a quick quote from her, which is, we are the, lead we are the leaders we have been looking for. And that's it. Thank you so much for my coming to my TED Talk. I'll pass back to Kyung. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Rohan. Thank you so much for sharing your work um, and for the work you're doing in community. Um, I think uh, definitely uh, the intercultural power, resource sharing and power sharing uh, is going to be a theme that we'll be uh, exploring even further in our conversation in the second hour. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. And also, um, yeah, just how our voice and our votes matter. I think that's something that one of our guest speakers will be addressing as well. So, um, uh, okay, so now we're gonna shift gears and go back to the world of Nero. Um, so the next excerpt we're going to show you is from the middle of act five of Nero, which we just rehearsed about a month ago. Um, so we're gonna skip a lot of the story and go straight to the end um, or close to the end. Um, and at this point in our story, Nero has killed almost everyone in the play his wife Octavia, his brother-in-law Britannicus, his military leaders, General Corbulo and Major Burris have been killed by his opposition and the war in Perthia has led his empire to financial collapse, which is our version of the 2008 Wall Street crash. And his mother Agrippina was meant to be killed by an ax propped above her bed while she was at sea, which is a true story that Nero did. Uh, but Agrippina in our story survives the waters, uh, which is our version of Hurricane Katrina and Nero has decided to kill Agrippina himself. Um, by this point, Nero trusts no one but his lover Sura and tutor Seneca, but Nero realizes that his tyranny and rule has gone too far. So now we're going to drop the link to a scene uh, very close to the show's end. Uh, before you watch it, something I will say is that Nero's fate, um, as in near the fall of his empire, has been foretold by uh, God in our play that is Kronos, the Greek god of time, who as usual in our story will make a cameo. Um, so just wanted to say that and uh, please enjoy the next video. Um, this is some of our very newest material just finished today. Enjoy. Baby, 
<laughs> You've come to set me free. <laughs> You're not going to kill mommy, are you? I'm not the first one to do it. I won't be the last. But, but you're not like everyone else. You are different. You are special. No. Maybe I'm just like every other sexually abused child. That's not possible. Nero, emperors and rulers are in a class of their own. No one is like us. No one. What's that? It's the dagger that you gave to Papaya. Nero, put that down. You are making a mistake. Kronos told me to do this from the beginning. If only I had listened to him. You're the one that started all of this. Did not. Did too. When I was a kid back in Aunt Julia's. But that was one night. You took away my virginity, mother. You raped me as a child. You were going to lose your virginity anyway. Um, I was 10. Ever since you slept with me, I've never felt safe. I couldn't love anyone because I was afraid they were dangerous. And they were. Everyone you know has tried to kill you. Mom, it wasn't just that once. When Messalina tried to feed me to the snake, you remember what you did? I was crying so much and you didn't know what to do with me, so... You gave me a blowjob. I was trying to console you. And then there was that time Claudius beat, beat Britannicus. We had gone to march at the Colosseum and Britannicus insisted on twirling at the top. Claudius was upset. What well, was it my fault he's gay? After Claudius beat me, what did you do? You had me gag you with truffles and pleasure you to ecstasy. Okay. So maybe sometimes I needed some consolation. Did you ever think about me? Oh, about what I felt being stuck in the midst of all this empire's craze? I made you emperor because I thought you'd be different. I am. And this is how we'll make a change. By killing me? by ending our line. Now that everyone's dead, if I kill you, there will be no more emperors in Rome. And the people will be left to form their own governments and they won't let idiots like us ruin the world. <laughs> Nero! Those people you're trying to liberate are the same people that voted those senators into Rome. They're the same people that followed Britannicus into his revolution. They're the same people that walked blindly into Corbulo's war. Well, who are we to judge what's best for them? Let me go. Whatever I've done wrong to you, you must forgive, forgive and forget, Nero. How can anyone ever forget what we've done? Our blood, these stains, they'll be nothing compared to what will remain of us. Nero, the people will forget. They'll just move on to their day-to-day -day lives and they won't care for what we've done. You cannot kill me for that, Nero. You can't. What did you do that for? Did you kill Aunt Julia? Nero. Nero. <laughs> I don't 
want to die like this. Untie me, Nero. Did you kill Aunt Julia? I confess. <laughs> Aunt Julia, I laid her to rest. Why? I just wanted what was best for you. If you <laughs> stayed in the woods, you would have never seen the world. You would have lived among the rivers and the forests, never seeing what you could have become. I could have been an artist. If you had just left me in the woods, I would have focused on my music. I would have kept painting the puppies and flowers I was surrounded with. How could you compare paintings and music with the power you've got now? Emperor Adolf was an artist. Doctor, he killed 60 million in war. Well, how many do you want me to kill before you let me live a life in obscurity, painting with pastels? You are so much more than that, Nero. All I want is for you to become the best man you can be. That's how this all began, Nero. What are you doing? Put that dagger down. <laughs> Mommy loves baby. Everything mommy did was for you. Even the blood I shed. <laughs> Is it time of coochie coo? No. I'm married now. I'm in love. Hey, uh, doesn't love you. Don't say that. That isn't true. She's plotting to overthrow you with Otho. Awesome. You see? <laughs> Mommy is the only one that loves baby. Baby's dead meat? No. No, 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 no. As long as baby loves mommy, mommy will make everything okay. Mommy will take care of baby as long as baby doesn't break mommy's heart. Is baby going to break? Mommy's heart. You can run away from it all. Hitting a brick wall Life must go back to zero Even if you're Nero I have nowhere else to go I've 
taken This shows every blow The life must go back to zero I a superhero the call I'm sorry mama I can't let you forestall Ronos wants you dead mama once and for all The only that we've got is to find for this blade a sweet spot life must go back to zero so says Nero <laughs> I dread we fled this pain in vain cause we have a rain to maintain life can go back to zero You happy now? Death doesn't make me happy. And what are you doing here? <laughs> All right. So uh take him a moment to take it in. Yeah. So um yeah, we're closing, uh, we're getting close to that end of that first hour, and we just wanted to share our art with you as a provocation and fuel for our conversation. But uh, this is definitely a lot, and we know it is a lot. Um, so to try to bring it all together into some sense, um, we're gonna now pass on the mic to Ryan Chen from Asians for Abolition, uh, who will be sharing with us yeah, sort of how the art and all of the history that we're sort of recalling sort of ties in together to where we are now. So um, go ahead, Ryan. Hi, <clears throat> hello, uh, my name is Ryan Shen. I am uh, currently celebrating some moon festival, but missing out. So I'm wearing um, a little uh, martial arts shirt um, sort of, to, uh, in the spirit of, um, to bring it here. And then um, can uh, Joe share the, uh, the slides? Cause I have a, a bunch of slides to just talk us through some of the points um, to tie in um, this uh, play with, um, with what is related to abolition and how is uh, related to abolition. Um, so as we see in the play it, uh, at the end, uh, you know, uh, the violence, uh, the, you know, powers that be still are unable to reflect on how, um, how it continues to be violent and how, to, you know, even harming, you know, um, his mom at the end. So, you know, um, uh, there needs to definitely be healing 
And um, as a member of Asians for Abolition, I believe abolition is the answer. And so I will show um, why uh, the term abolition is important and why I think we need to use that term. So uh, next slide. So um, the empire spins narratives of morality that help keep people complicit within the country uh, and villainizes folks disposable to uphold racial capitalism. Similarly, the empire spins narratives of morality to what is happening outside the country as justification to send in the military. American exceptionalism is a justification as to why the invasion by this country is necessary, but really the intent is to extract things like oil out of the ground and destroy other people's livelihoods so that people are more easily manipulated. Um, so capitalism has always required the social differentiation and hierarchization of race. Cedric Robinson theorized the linkage between racial, racialized expropriation and capitalist plunder as racial capitalism to make clear that the social differentiation of race is not a secondary outcome of capitalism, but rather the racial expropriation of land, labor, and life is innately constitutive of capitalism. This is a quote from Harsha Walia. Next slide. Uh, so here, this play tells the story of a war on terror. Uh, the tragedy of what happened in Afghanistan parallels the tragic scenes in this play. Um, it demonstrates that military, military occupation was not out of care of impact on the people there. But it's even important to notice um, uh, that the backstory that led us to this point um, that in August, of what happened in August 2020 is uh, started a long time ago. For example, uh, it's actually the conflict started during the Cold War um, and the United States had armed uh, groups by funneling weapons through Pakistan. Um, then a civil war eventually uh, started leaving 1 million, Af um, uh, 1 million Afghans dead and uh, millions escaped to Pakistan. Uh, Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda and Taliban emerged because, of, because the CIA took its eyes off. Um, and then 9-11 just gave the excuse to occupy Af Afghanistan again until it just didn't, you know, had and no more value in that. And it also helped define what, uh, what racially, what terrorists look like. Uh, next slide. So while we have pulled out of Afghanistan now, we have to also recognize there are other occupations that are still ongoing today, particularly in Israel and Korea. In New York City, there are a few organizations that are particularly anti-militarism and you know, uh, critical of what nation states mean. Um, from my personal experience, I've learned some things uh, that, that are specific and I would like to share here. Um, for example, minefields are, and explosives are left behind for locals to contend with, even in peace. Toxins from the weapons uh, affect the health of the locals. Locals suffer from psychological trauma from sudden drone strike strikes. Uh, this is usually in the Middle East. Uh, artificial borders separate families. Also, uh, you know, the Gaza situation. Women are objectified by violent men. Um, this can be seen in uh, Korea um, too um, and uh, Vietnam War. Uh, hostile social conditions amplify hostility towards differences and help uphold racist tropes. This is also racial and misogynistic tropes too. And then refugees looking for safety from the conditions are subjected to amoral controls of immigration and customs enforcement then. Next slide. Uh, so social differentiation makes it easier to target any group to, to, to say that they deserve less for their labor. And this goes across the board and across uh, different racial categorizations, in including here uh, an example of how Chinese immigrants were exploited uh, during the Transcontinental Railroad um, uh, wage. They were, they, they were paid half the wages 
with uh, uh, in living in tents instead of uh, train cars and uh, had to do the most dangerous work. Next slide. And then, um, no, and now I'm starting to approach the reason why the term abolition, but the original definition of abolition um, was the movement to end slavery and the, uh, the systemic perpetual ability to exploit black people's bodies and labor, right? So that works, that work continues today because exploiting bodies and labor is now done through the exceptional categories of a convicted criminal while they had added the 13th Amendment to the Constitution and created the prison industrial complex. And then did the, we had the war on, on drugs, which uh, specifically targeted Black people. And then, um, and then they also expanded and integrated to immigration detention. Next slide. And here is an example of how prison labor is exploited recently, right? Prisoners are getting paid $1.45 a day to fight the California wildfires. Um, next slide. So um, as you can see, I'm advocating very hard for using the term abolition. Um, and I just wanna end it with a couple of points I would like to make uh, also, rep um, relevant to some of the things that were referenced in the play scenes that we've seen. Um, so since injustice, uh, unjust equity of bodies and labor continues, even though slavery has ended, using the term abolition acknowledges it is the continued work necessary because of the underlying so societal conditions. Um, and then uh, another great reason is abolition challenges the existing hegemony, uh, which benefits human relations uh, as it allows us to start thinking about how we how to relate differently. Uh, for example, if we make changes in our relation to the land, for example, following indigenous knowledge, we could stem our climate crisis. Um, queer and polyamorous relationships can also continue uh, can be finally free to thrive, and then harm caused by humans from like climate change to domestic violence to like sexual violence to all kinds of things are so pervasive and mutual aid which is also a core um, practice of abolition is necessary to limit the harm and heal from it and i'm rushing through this because i realize we're trying to keep it in the reps so um that's it for me wow. thank you so much uh brian thank you um that was a great presentation um I am so thoughtful and I'm sure you are too. Uh, so what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna take a five minute break and then begin our long table and invite all of you to join us in conversation. Um, so uh, it's 8.07, let's be back by um, 8.12.13. We're actually gonna play a song. So when the song is over, we'll be back. Um, so thank you and we'll see you in a bit. My dear family, do as I say There's no more time for child's play If you ignore me, there's a high price to pay You can try to escape me, no way you'll get away
My wife Octavia, do as I say. Today's no day to vacay. Try to seduce me, I'll puke on the parquet. You can try to control me, but I won't love ya. No way! No way! City of sin, Rome, no goodness to see, Rome, you make my head spin, Rome, suck my head, Rome, city of sin, Rome, no goodness to see, Rome, well fuck you, fuck me, Rome, suck my head. Douche Britannicus, do as I say. Don't try to oust me, you're gay. Try to dethrone me, you'll only go astray. You can revolt against me, but I'll hang you in display. And welcome back, everyone. Um, we're going to start our long table now. And I'd like to invite Jess uh, to share with us just a few guidelines on how we're going to handle the long table through Zoom and then invite you all to join us in conversation. Take it away, Jess. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Um, so uh, yes, we're at the point of doing the long table. Um, if, for Abolish the Empire, and to share a little bit about what a long table is, uh, they are performance installations that were developed by artist Lois Weaver, um, and she was experimenting with using the private form of a dinner party as a structure for public debate. Um, it, the long table encourages informal conversations on serious subjects and uh, experiments with formats that inspire public engagement. KPB has incorporated long tables into our practice to develop new work and conversations with local community partners, artists, scholars, activists, and general audiences in theaters, uh, in academic institutions, community organizations, and performing arts festivals. So the etiquette itself, uh, this is a performance of a dinner party conversation being held now over Zoom. Anyone seated at the table is a welcome guest talk is the only course. Uh, a host will assist us, and tonight our host is Jason Wu, who's co-chair of Good Pimney. Invited guests hold knowledge, and they will share that content with our community. And tonight's guests, we have Rohan, who we heard from, uh, from the Blasian March, and talking about solidarity. Uh, Eric Lockley, who's a producing artistic leader for the Movement Theater. Zara Nasir, coordinator for the People's Plan New York City. And we have Ishmael Tahir, 
who is part of KPB, and you've seen him in the performances tonight. Um, and um, so our meal is a democracy to participate. Simply use the raise your hand function, and Joe is going to support the spotlight for you. Uh, if the table is full, you can request a seat. If you leave the table, you can come back again and again. There can be silence. There can be thoughts written in the comment section. There might be awkwardness. There could always be laughter. There is an end, but there isn't a conclusion. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Sorry, I'm a little slow. Um, yeah, so this is a really um, big topic of discussion, abolishing the empire. And um, there's a lot of issues and ways that we can explore this topic. Um, I wanted to open off with a, a quote from one of my um, mentors and some I look up to very, very much so, Kimberly Crenshaw, who once said, when there's no name for a problem, you can't see a problem. When you can't see a problem, you can't solve it. And so with that in mind, where and how do we see militarization at play within our communities? That's the first question. Um, do you want the invited speakers to kind of jump in? However? Yes, yes, please. Cool. Um, so I can start. Um, so again, uh, my name is Zara. I am um, one of the coordinators of uh, the People's Plan, which is a multi-issue uh, social and racial justice um, platform that we've been building for uh, more than a year. Um, and it takes kind of uh, all, you know, many of the advocates and organizers who are working on issues across housing and economic justice and um, economic justice and education um, and climate and health uh, and um, transit and tries to um, have those issues speak to each other because we know that in real life they do. <laughs> um, and it's very, it's, it's New York City specific because um, many of you might know, but 2021 was a pretty big election year for the city. Um, most of the city council was um, open seats and um, there was a completely open seat for the mayor, comptroller, um, lots of powerful city level positions. So we were doing organizing to um, influence some of the conversations that were happening during um, those races. And um, I think just to this question, I think like actually the work that we're doing is really, um, you know, like how, how and where and how do we see militarization at plays within our communities? Um, I think especially in a year that we've had, like, like the year that we've had where um, there's so much uh, economic and social insecurity because of COVID, we're seeing how politicians are using that and the crime narrative to really, um, you know, like solidify their support uh, for um, whatever position they're running for. And so if folks don't know very much about the mayoral elect Eric Adams, um, he won the Democratic primary in June and is, you know, has almost, um, you know, will almost uh, very likely win the general election in November because we're a democratic city. And so we, we tend to vote um, Democrat for the general as well. Um, and he really ran on this like, you know, uh, law and order, um, you know, going to uh, bring back stop and frisk, going to bring back, um, plain clothes officers, like many of the things that, um, I know Jihoon's not here, but like, you know, many of the things that CPR has been working on, many of the people, many of the things that my organization that I work for formerly, um, New York City Anti-Violence Project has been working on. And um, it's really scary, right? Cause it, it's like a lot of using the, the need that is in um, the reason why we, many of us like started mutual aid networks and, um, tried to come together after the devastation of the pandemic, um, using this to bolster the police state, 
basically. And that's really scary. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. I will be as bold as to jump in real fast. I don't know if there's an order. Okay. Um, and I'll be pretty, pretty quick. Um, from the perspective of both myself and representing the Movement Theater Company, we embrace storytellers. So one of the things that, um, one of the spaces that I feel militarization is happening is even within storytelling and this, the stories that are being celebrated. Um, specifically, I, I consider that um, the Oscars, this is filmmaking now, but there are other places, <laughs> um, but the Oscars best short film went to a short film called Two Distant Strangers that was about a black man experiencing a Groundhog's Day version of, you know, uh, looped over and over day of being killed by a police officer. And, you know, I think all artists have every right to do what they feel passionate about. But the idea that that won, um, and literally it's about, you know, a little under 30 minutes of watching this black man continuously be killed. It's like, why is that being celebrated? And, you know, and then, Within theater, I mean, there's some plays that I won't uh, uh, call out specifically because I know we're all in that industry. But there are there are plays that are very celebrated that you know it's like why do we have to watch the rape or the death of people of color for these things to be um, to teach us something? And what is and if it's teaching us something, what is it teaching us? Is it teaching us that we continuously lose? Is it teaching us that we must you know? arm ourselves or is it teaching us that it's a losing battle you know um and i think one of the goals for us as an organization is to activate imagination for artists of color in a way that empowers them and tell reminds us that we ought to be celebrated for fighting the powers that be or for living our lives and you know and celebrating love and embracing innocence and embracing joy um so i think it is really important to examine the ways in which for us as an organization, what we try to do is both bring imagination into the space for artists of color so that stories can reflect a wide range, um, but also to then partner with activists and social justice organizations so that we're also including education about how uh, our audiences and our artists can get active and make real change, but in a while also imagining a brighter or a different future. Yeah, that's really great. I think that um, both of you have raised some really interesting points. I think that sometimes when we talk about militarization or policing, we think of it as literally the physical force and guns and weapons. But um, to your point, Eric, there's also a cultural and psychological dimension to this. And there is a role for art in challenging representations and that um, representation can be political. Sometimes it gets talked about in a way that I think leaves a lot of us on the left feeling unsatisfied. Um, but I think to what you're getting at, there's, there's something much deeper there that um, can do some uh, important foundational change in our society. And to um, Zara's point um, around public safety, I think that there's a way in which that connects with broader discourses around national security. And so some of these local struggles regarding policing um, is also very much tied to these broader uh, national security debates and the um, kind of budgeting for the military industrial complex, the Pentagon. And so I think there's also connections there between the local and the global. And so I don't know if either of you want to share a little bit more, if anyone else wants to weigh in on this question regarding how we see militarization in our, in our communities. Can I say just, oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yes, and then we have a stack, Jason, just in case you missed it. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make this plug. I feel like I, you know, I've, I've worked um, in New York City Council and I um, joke to people that I was like more um, of a spy than, <laughs> than anything else. Like I really tried to um, use my position there to get information out to people who are organizing and really facilitate, um, you know, the, um, I mean, we know government is very opaque. I think on the local le level, it's supposed to be more accessible. You can actually go 
you know, senior city council member, like the, the specific, um, they have offices in specific districts, um, you know, they're more approachable than your Congress member or somebody um, on, the, on the national or federal level. But at the same time, there's still a lot of, um, you know, willful, like keeping the public out of decision-making, willful keeping the public um, from getting information. And so um, I just, I'm, I'm saying this just to say that I think because there's a distrust, there's also sometimes a disconnection from local politics, right? Like people feel, um, uh, especially folks who are internationalists who like are really paying attention to what's happening abroad. Um, they sometimes don't realize like how um, many of our, uh, you know, like these horrible Congress people who are like voting for wars and voting all for like all these terrible things, um, they actually start on the local level. I'm gonna, I just wanna give an example Again, I, I'm like missing Juhian because I'm like, she also hates Rishi Torres. I just, <laughs> um, but like people who don't know, Rishi Torres was um, a council member who, who basically screwed us on a police accountability um, bill at the city council, right to know. And um, he just basically like completely uh, watered it down and negotiated it down with administration and then refused to. Um, hold it back and just passed it anyway, even though um, a lot of the advocates um, and organizers working on it were like, don't do this. And now he is a Congress member. And guess what? Like on his first or second day, he is, he took like the most Zionist stance that he could um, because, you know, he, he was like, oh, this is what I need to do to succeed. Right. Um, and it's, I don't think it's disconnected from the fact that, um, many council members are given these free trips to go to Israel um, and like basically get indoctrinated in um, the Zionist um, imperialist politic and they just kind of fail upwards. So um, I'm just making a plug that like all politics is local and I just think it's so important for people to pay attention um, in this very local way because it does influence what happens um, both here, abroad, nationally, all the things. Um, and they are banking on us to not pay attention, so. Thank you. And then Ryan, um, you're next. Yeah, so to build on that a little bit, I mean, uh, the reason why I think some of the at, uh, movement around Israel is based in New York City is because a lot of the power is centralized here, right? So that's also something to pay attention to. Um, and then in terms of local politics, I mean, um, I would want to raise like the militarization of the local politics comes into play from like even uh, things that are the state social services, you know? Um, so like, for example, I recently found out that uh, the parent moms uh, who are living, uh, who are in Harlem are being threatened by ACS to, to have their children taken away from them because they refuse to send their children into the schools, which are not safe to send into. So, you know, that's militarizing, like something that's supposed to be public good um, into a weapon. So um, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll just share that. But. Thanks, Ryan. And Rohan, you're next. Yeah, I just want to like quickly tie in some things that and echo and like affirm some things that I heard that I resonated with. Um, so like, um, uh, I feel like when, when Eric, when you're talking about, um, you know, how we police stories, how we could we control narratives or how like things are being policed to present a certain narrative, right? Um, I know right now in the literary world, um, I'm a writer and it's kind of exploding right now because like there was a recent call from publishers for more urban writing from black writers and we're like, what does that mean? <laughs> it's like, I don't know what that means, honey, but okay. Um, and I think that really ties in with um, what Zara was mentioning earlier about um, the elections, because I feel like, well, elections here, because I know pushing for um, more of the more left-leaning candidates, particularly the ones who had a platform to close 
major prisons like Rikers Island um, to close, um, to defund the police even more by a billion dollars. But we wound up with Eric Adams, who was an ex-cop for folks who don't know, who was also a black man. And I think that shows how within this, I guess, microcosm of the empire, um, we tend to police ourselves, um, how, especially when we look at how white communities police our communities because they benefit from the empire, they benefit from empire structures. So voting for a black man who's an ex-cop um, after the huge wave of Black Lives Matter movements um, this year and the previous year, I really feel plays into this idea that like white people or white society can still maintain control in New York by thinking that voting for a black ex-cop is the compromise when it's not for communities of color, when police are still killing us. Um, so that to me is like, it's also shows like how I feel, you know, this is, this is how we police each other. This is how we, we, we assume that certain narratives are only permissible when it's a trending topic. So like we only look at Black Lives Matter when it's a trending topic. We only look at South Asian hate when it's a trending topic. And yet once that's on a trending topic, all of a sudden the narrative must be controlled and must be forced to go back into what makes white society most comfortable. Thank you. I think um, a lot of the comments so far have nicely framed um, a lot of what the issues are, what the problems are, and how they show up. And, and so let's talk about how do we activate our communities to demilitarize this country and to defund the police? What are kind of the things that we can do? Um, part of what I heard is um, politics, government is a site of political struggle. Um, so I'm curious if anyone wants to build on that in terms of what that struggle looks like, as well as any other um, strategies and campaigns and things that folks want to share. And we have our invited speakers, but you know we can open this up definitely to the other attendees here tonight. Zara, did you want to start us off? I think Jess is. Um, I was just going to jump in, and one of the ways, one of the organizations that I'm working with is called Ac um, Amplifying Activists Together, and it's it's um, a current or a ripple of people who are who the spies from city council who then also are talking to organizations like J Fridge um, or um, uh, CPR or Catal, and then they're steering us into the local actions that we can take to then make the calls to our representatives um, and to actually like just amplify the voices of legislation that needs to be passed or legislation that needs to be abolished um, and also amplify uh, organizations that are working for community safety. So um, we meet every Friday at uh, 1 p.m. if anybody is ever interested in that, we're just reconvening now and it's a great way to support uh, and to be part of the local action here. Yeah, that's really great. I think um, tying the work to collective action is, is really important that we're trying to build movements here for change. And so next we have on stack is Ishmael. Uh, I feel like a really key component of activating our communities and to demilitarize is um, opening up the scope of our imagination. I think when we think about militarization, we don't think about the militarization of our psyches and of our history. Um, often people feel like this is, this is all there is. <laughs> this is all that we have. So uh, I think by breaking down those walls um, and intentionally building community, to um, show each other like we can help each other, we can provide for one another, whether that's you know mutual aid programs um, or educational programs that you know teach us about the power historically, right? Not just in this abstract sense, but historically the power of community building and solidarity and unity and looking out for each other, drawing from real concrete experiences, not only here locally in New York or in the United States, but globally, right? Because the whole the whole system of the United States, like it, it 
global imperialism. So if we show people and we humanize the rest of the world, right? Showing like, yeah, we know that we're over in the Middle East for oil, but like this, this is inhabited by people, right? A million Iraqis died, right? Or we, we talk about um, what's going on in South America. Like if we um, show that community is powerful and it goes just beyond what we have here, um, with like concrete examples and then use those examples to inform how we show up for each other now and today, um, I think that'll be a huge component um, to combat the nihilism that keeps us complacent, right? The status quo, like nihilism is the status quo, um, but if we combat that with community, um, yeah, I think that will be a really helpful tool in organizing and mobilizing people. Thank you. And Next on the stack, we have Rohan. Um, so one of my really close collaborators on the West Coast, her name is Soleil Yu, and her um, organization, Life Affirming Nectar, really does a lot of this work about um, re-educating the community. And she uses this term called political imagination. And it's, it's reassessing how we literally politicize ourselves and, and our livelihoods. Um, she does, she has a really perfect example. Um, for example, um, the uh, LA riots, you know, we are always taught this very specific narrative that this was a very specific black Asian violent tension. Um, that narrative never assesses how actually Korean immigrants were forced into those communities. We're already underserved communities. It never assesses how actually white structures of control and power like police and fire department did nothing while Black and Korean communities actually really harmed each other. That narrative also completely ignores uh, the fact that Black and Korean communities on the ground level were actually working on solidarity at the exact same time. So I think one way to really activate our communities is, was, is really just to present a different story, a story that's actually rooted in our truths as marginalized communities, as communities of color. Um, so like, for example, with my work, we always try to have um, performing artists who are of very marginalized experiences so that we can counter narratives. So we always have, for example, um, constant stereotypes about black bodies in the media, but then on the ground level, when we finally see, for example, a black Egyptian trans woman dancing and having you know, the time of her life, it presents a whole new narrative of joy for these people and these experiences. Thanks, Rohan. I think Kyung is next. Yeah, um, I guess I wanted to share part of my context. I grew up in Chile, so my context is really from out of <laughs> down in South America. But um, you know, I, 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 you know, w one of our pieces, um, uh, our pr previous piece, Tala, you know, was about just like the relationship between uh, Chile's dictatorship and the way it was imposed by the CIA. And there's so much about, you know. Um, neoliberal capitalism and the shock doctrine and the way, you know, sort of like um, uh, capitalism just inter, uh, like is, is imposed, right? Like, like in a nation and, and, uh, and then political trauma is sort of used as a way of like instilling that like political and economic model, you know, in a society, which is like so harmful. Um, and before the pandemic, um, the whole country went ablaze in a constitutional reform because when the CIA uh, instilled the dictatorship, the first thing they did was rewrite the constitution and allocate about like 70% of the country's wealth into the military. And that is one of the main reasons why this constitutional reform was necessary because so much of the way, you know, Chile was colonized was by extracting its resources and putting it into weaponizing the entire nation. Um, and it just makes me think about how we need to, um, how, and I guess my curiosity is, right, like, at, at the year of a white nationalist uprising, <laughs> you know, that was trying to, like, take over this country, right, through, like, these very militarized, like, tactics, like, what kind of structural political reforms need to be made to change just what it is we value and to take away the value of weaponizing our societies. Um, so, um, 
So I know a lot of that has to do with revolution and political transformation. I don't know how that translates into what we can do here in our communities, but I just kind of wanted to share that because that's been sitting on my mind a lot as we've been working. Thanks, Kelly. I think, you know, just to tie to some of the comments earlier from Ishmael and also Rahan um, and Eric earlier that, you know, I think revolution, it's something that's off in the distance, but also um, it's about storytelling. The stories actually have power that they can mobilize. They can be used to organize communities. Um, there are places where we can find hope. There are places where we can reimagine and um, envision the kind of world that we want to live in. So I just wanted to make that connection. And um, I want to pass it on now to Ryan and then Zara. Hey, I go first? Sure. Okay. So um, I was thinking about, oh my God, I think I'm about to forget what I was thinking about. Um, so storytelling, right? Like, I think, I do think that that's very important um part of this because all of the right-wing propagandas are stories as well and we need to break down those stories um and sometimes it's just to you know the the the, the we do have stories about how pressed uh some folks are for example how um indigenous women and children are disappearing and no one's paying attention to that because like is for some reason the story doesn't seem believable or you know I don't know something and so how do we make it so tactile enough to make it feel like something people should care about right so I, I want to also push and say that it's not just storytelling but also connecting with the actual people because like I didn't know how big the community, indigenous community is here in New York City until I went to, um, what's it called? The, the uh, event October for, for Indigenous Day where I, I saw people and how they are living now and how that sort of um, re, like challenged like the narrative that's so deeply imprinted into my brain of like what's hap what has happened in New York City, for example. So I think that it's important to to reach out and be curious too. And you know, um, that's where the solidarity comes in when we like try to be curious about each other's experiences and um, understanding of what people's lives are like, that it also helps break down um, break down the, the, the idea that the stories we're being fed should be um, trusted at all, so, yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Zara, you're next. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, to the points that were made by some of the folks who were speaking earlier, like, I think it is a lot about, like, connecting struggles, right? And like what we talked about earlier, um, like applying internationalism to the local context, applying localism to the international complex, uh, internationalist context, um, right? Like I think Palestinian, uh, I'm not Palestinian, I'm Pakistani, but my best friend is Palestinian. I'm just doing Palestinian organizing just to spend time with her. <laughs> so um, I, you know, I think like some of the things that um, within our lifetime, which is one of the groups that's doing Palestinian organizing in New York City has done is think about like, okay, where are the Zionist, um, uh, like, you know, the, the offices of the um, companies that steal land from Palestinians in New York City, like there's actually offices here, right, that like perpetuate that kind of um, land grabbing. There's also um, you know, there was a lot of block the boat actions this summer. I don't know if people saw that, but like there are are large, um, you know, ginormous uh, um, uh, ships that um, deliver uh, very, you know, as a totality, very expensive goods 
um, that are coming that and Zim is, is a Israeli company. And so just by blocking a boat for a few hours, you can make a Zionist company lose a ton of money. Right? So there's a lot going on that I think helps us connect um, international and local struggles together. I think one thing that's really important is like having really high standards. Like I think sometimes when I talk about like, um, you know, being, you know, like pay attention to what your government's doing, your local government's doing. I, I, I fear that people um, will take that as like, like do electoral organizing and like have bad politics. I'm like, that's not what I'm saying at all. I think it's like the, you know, critical resistance has this like abolitionist reforms versus reformist reforms. And I think the more we start to think about that, like we need to be putting pressure on our local governments to actually respond to people's needs uh, because there's a fundamental problem with the way it's doing it right now, right? And so that means that um, we're paying attention to the way like, you know, policing is a monster, like militarization is a monster, it transforms every time you kind of get a good look at it. And so the NYPD is not the only enemy, right? It's like policing is a function. It's not just one job. And so social workers can be police. Your neighbor could be the police. Mandatory reporting is policing. There's drug testing and of parents and hospitals. The family regulation system is the police. So I think it's like really thinking about like, how are we building the infrastructure for rebellion? I think that's how I think about it. Like, I think when we think about like 2020 and defund, like that moment was not possible in New York City if people had not built the groundwork for, for when things explode for us to like sprint, right? And like, that's the year 58, the, repeal, the 58 police secrecy law was repealed. That's the year where, I mean, we didn't win defund really because the cops just got like the same amount of money and they just like, you know, did musical chairs with it. But I mean, it, it I think a lot of it is about like, we need to be ready for the moments where there's like just a, a, usually it's because of something horrific and something terrible happening. I mean, Rikers is an example of this as well, where like right now there are calls to release everybody from Rikers because of how horrific it is. But again, it's like the organizing that has allowed people to build the infrastructure to have really, really, you know, to have their demands ready, to have like the abolitionist reforms ready, all of those pieces um, feels really important. Thank you, Zara. So we're running towards the end of the program and I wanted to open it up for closing remarks. It could be from our invited speakers or anyone else um, who's here with us tonight. Something that I, I'll just share really quick is that um, there are many different roles and movements that have been raised tonight, different organizations. Um, there's different sites of political struggle, different sites of power, that's local politics. It could be in your local neighborhood. It could be militarization and occupation um, in the Middle East. It could, it could be the media. It could be um, uh, journalism. It could be storytelling. There are so many different ways in which these things um, intersect and interplay. And so um, I'm gonna share in the chat, uh, it's, it's called um, The Map for Social Change Ecosystem by Deepa Ayer, and she kind of lays out different roles. Because I think sometimes people do feel a sense of hopelessness or helplessness. And there definitely is a role for everybody, whether you're working in the arts, whether you're working in electoral politics, whether you're doing grassroots organizing, mutual aid. So, um, I wanted to share that, and if there's any other closing remarks, now's your time. Can I do a shameless plug? Oh, <laughs> sorry, Eric, go ahead. <laughs> Same time. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you. I think the, the conversation has been really engaging and um, and has has so many levels, which is so important. I think this collection of folks is able to address in a very unique way that, you know, we talked about so many topics and internationalism and storytelling and, and it, it is that huge, you know? So I just, I thank you all for creating this space and, and for sharing. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Rohan? 
Yeah. Um, echoing Eric, I love this space. Thank you for having us. Um, in response to Kyung's question in the comments, um, how are we building the infrastructure for rebellion? I think it's happening right here, right now. I mean, we're having these conversations. We're holding space. We are allowing for um, what Grace Lee Boggs called critical connections. Um, so I have critical numbers. Um, and that's super important. Um, also, horrible shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway. thanks, Jason. Okay. <laughs> so um, October 16th for the Blasian March, um, we're celebrating our one year anniversary. Um, it's also, we are doing this through a Black Asian trans power rally. It's a solidarity action that will basically build Black Asian solidarity on the intersection of trans liberation, since trans people are parts of all of our communities and therefore integral to all of our communities. Um, this will be held in New York. Um, LA, New Haven, we're also working in other cities. So if anyone's interested in collaborating or wants to know more about that, or wants to just show up to those cities, um, you can definitely um, reach out to me um, and I will send more information that way, yeah. Thanks, Rohan. And if there's any other information folks want to share, feel free to drop it in the chat. And I'm gonna turn it now over to Kim. Off mute. Great. Thank you so much uh, for for this long table conversation. And uh, Rohan, you 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 said what I wanted to say. I really do think you know the answer is in the critical connections, as you mentioned, that we can build together in community and spaces like this. And in a lot of our explorations of how to dismantle white supremacy, we've been creating spaces uh, through our organization for people of color to be able to come together and to share their histories and the work that we're doing um, in community. And it is this kind of space that inspires me and empowers us to keep working as an organization. I believe that the answers and the solutions for what the world can be is in the worlds we are creating here in these spaces right now. So um, I, I'm very inspired and grateful and um, always just, just so moved by like what comes from us being able to come together in these ways. Um, we are running a little late in the program and we did have one more piece we wanted to share with you before our time is up, but I am just going to um, uh, switch the order a little bit. And yes, the Movement Theater Company has a production coming up at Playwrights Horizons. Please do check it out. Rohan, thank you for plugging your march. I was gonna ask you about it if you didn't. Um, Sarah, please keep us, up, keep us posted on what's happening uh, with the People's Plan. Um, and uh, I also just wanted to acknowledge how much of this work is happening um, and requires uh, uh, support. Um, one of the reasons why we also wanted to share this space with community partners is because um, we were planning for this event and felt that after a year and a half into this pandemic, there was just this kind of general exhaustion um, for doing this work and also a lot of sense of uh, concerned that the sort of interest and movement that was happening last year, we're not seeing again this year as people are sort of trying to quote unquote, go back to whatever that normal was. So um, just just please connect with each other and support one another and, and please keep us in, uh, informed of what it is you're doing. Um, our, our goal is to continue developing this piece for production in the next 15 months. And along with that, we wanna continue having these conversations to organize a campaign. And a lot of these conversations we've been having over the past year are deliberate attempts to find who our partners are, who we can collaborate with, how we can work together, how we can build together. And as Rohan mentioned, how we can share resources and uplift each other's stories and narratives so that we are seen by each other in different ways. Um, so along with that, um, I guess I'm just gonna set some context and uh, share with you um, our, our last uh, uh, excerpt of our play. Um, we're gonna show you um, the end of Nero. And um, in our play, uh, you know, Nero represents white supremacy and in our artistic desires to investigate how to dismantle white supremacy, uh, we intentionally centered uh, this character by an ensemble of people of color rising for power. Um, and we used 
the Shakespearean tragic dramatic structure because colonial mindsets revere Shakespeare as another text to worship, the way we worship the Bible. And in Shakespearean productions, people of color are seldom cast to play any parts. And in the originals, women weren't even allowed on stage. So we've tried to subvert this racist and sexist traditional canon and create our own state of the nation play. And like the way we've seen decolonizing actions bring down monuments, um, this is the kind of monument uh, that, uh, that we are bringing down in our story through the telling of Nero. So we're gonna share with you the link and ask you if you have time to join us back for some final words um, and for our closing. But for now, um, we just wanted to share with you the end of Nero and the link is gonna drop in the chat. People of Rome, I have said many times that change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. The problems we face do not come down from the heavens. They are made. They are made by bad human decisions and good human decisions can uh, change them. But for years, we have suffered under the reign of a despot, someone who caused terror in the world and brought to us great suffering. We must bring this man to justice or we will invite tyrannical men who raise children in golden palaces, legitimize hatred and violence and grab women by the pussy to destroy the moral authority of what we call governance. I think we know that we have to stand together if we're going to survive together and grow together. In this world, in the world of tomorrow, we must go forward together or not at all. So tonight we honor the men and women who have brought us together, Otho, Caesar, Augustus, and Papea, Sabina. Papaya and I are humble folks, the best kind of humble. We came from Parthia offering a simple, just a simple, okay, folks. We like simple, this guy likes simple gifts. Simple gift of the Dibba. I still have trouble saying it. Democracy. And justice. And disguised as a Trojan horse, the best kind. Best slave. It was not our intention to bring down Nero. We just came to collect what you owe us. What we're owed is, it's a little word called freedom. You know it, freedom. We all love And it. free, we will all be. Now a peace de resistance. Nero's farewell tour. I'm glad this is amusing you. I'm glad my death is entertaining. Are you gonna watch me die? I see now. You never loved me. You never did. All of this was a trap. I gave you everything. Citizen, I made you empress. And you, Otho, 
How do you betray me like this? After we connected Parthia to the empire and found ways to trade goods to help each other's families, to help them live better lives, I never expected this from you. You're my friend. So much for friendship. So much for being friends. I see now. I am alone. No one has pity for me. No one cares for my woes. This is how I'll die, isn't it? Tonight, under the waning moon, they're gonna slip my wrists and you're just going to watch me fucking die. Fuck you. Fuck you for making this an event for your pleasure when you knew from the beginning that this is what was to come. I didn't want to be emperor. That wasn't my dream. My dream was to sing. taking a walk and I was so lonely I began to sing to myself I raised my voice to the heavens and a bush set on fire and I stared at its flames for a second transfixed I realized I had a voice, and this voice had power. <sighs> I decided to sing henceforth, to do it when most necessary. And day after day, I practiced out there. All of them. And the bush I saw was never consumed by its flames. All I want is to extend my arms. Peace and love. sing to people the way I sang to the trees in the forest and to look up at the sky and the clouds and wait wait for it to rain thirst of mine. But no. I won't sing. I won't sing to you. No. Not to you.
Oh. But an artist dies with me. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. <laughs> it's like, how do you respond to? <laughs> yes. The music is incredible. Composer Helen is here. Um, so we're a little over time. So I just love to ask all of us, if you can, to uh, turn on your video cameras and as a way of sort of bringing this evening to an end, um, I'd like to just ask you all to, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'll let you, um, one second, Ariel. Uh, the question is, uh, what word, image, or quote will you take with you after our event tonight? And we'd love to just hear everyone's voice. So uh, please feel free to go off mute and share. And that's the way we're gonna bring our evening to a close. Rebellion intercultural power spies <laughs> counter narrative chaos debunk <laughs> critical connections building the infrastructure for rebellion collective chant as powerful Connecting struggles. Power of possibility. International and local, uh, the connection between international and local politics. Anyone? I too was thinking international and local. I'm thinking about institutional, institutionalism. Collaboration. Action. Oh, I didn't hear what you said, Isaac. Oh, no, it's not coming across. Unity. Unity. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all for such a such a moving and inspiring evening. Um, I am very grateful for all of you to uh, be here and be a part of this evening. Uh, and uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been a really powerful conversation in a very, um, uh, a very meaningful way of celebrating this journey we've had as a company and uh, as a part of uh, this community. Uh, so much gratitude to you all. Thank you and have a great night. We are the ones who've been waiting. Mm -hmm. We are the ones who've been waiting for. We are the ones who've been waiting. Y'all can join in. I put the word in there. <laughs> we are the ones who've been waiting.